great pleasure to welcome you to our last session on uh, territories that I'm co-organizing together with Melissa uh, Topalovic, uh, Ferdinand, uh, where is Ferdinand? And Sasha. Where is Sasha? Here. Uh, <laughs> Great, this was an extremely interesting semester and I, I personally very much like this rhythm of uh, five, five sessions. Um, and this, this semester we had a cascade of uh, th three interrelated uh, themes. So territory, obviously, as the, the, the big major uh, theme that we are carrying from year to year. And then a vicious subtitle, uh, Urbanism Beyond Neoliberalism, which was extremely difficult for our guests uh, to uh, address because they are entangled uh, in these uh, political and economic uh, systems. And lastly, a project which was the easiest one uh, to address if you, if you uh, look at uh, the work that we've analyzed during, during the semester. So this cascade of three themes uh, was addressed by five uh, speakers with uh, respective respondents. Uh, the first one was Momoyo Kajima, who started bottom-up from the project. was extremely interesting. She showed us one project in, in Japan, and she worked her way through, uh, through neoliberalism. So the project she showed was a counter-proposal uh, for what we normally encounter in contemporary uh, practice. Uh, and ultimately, the, the question was, could you upscale it to the level of territory? Because it was clearly a bottom-up uh, approach. Uh, the second lecture by Melissa Topalovic started the other way around and, and focused on territory and the forces at work in the production of territory using one of her case studies was Singapore, uh, focusing on the resource uh, sand. Uh, and she was able to frame sand within uh, a, a neoliberal uh, discourse that we encounter in, in many countries, highlighting uh, the conflicts and the potential of that resource in territorial uh, production. Uh, the third lecture by Raquel Rolnik from Sao Paulo, uh, she works also with, with the UN, uh, highlighted the role of housing as a territorial uh, project. She advised Lula, uh, President Lula, who is now in jail, uh, in, in his housing policies. She was against some of his uh, policies, and she was able to bridge the three themes, okay, the projects, projects, she showed us projects of housing and housing as a territorial issue, but also as an alternative to uh, neoliberalism. The fourth lecture by Stefano Burri was extremely interesting because he started with a significant discourse on the production of nature. If you remember the earthquakes uh, that, that, that he addressed. And then he moved straight to one project, the Bosco Verticale, uh, uh, one, one project, okay? and it became, so it's this high-rise building with, with the trees, and became very clear that his strategy was being appropriated by the neoliberals. I mean, the more we moved into the lecture, the more it became clear that, that his objectives were being appropriated by uh, developers all over the world, in China, in Singapore, even in Lausanne uh, currently. And so he's producing these Bosco Verticales now at, at the speed, speed of, of light. So we have a very interesting uh, lecture in which, uh, let's say, the dilemma became uh, very clear. Uh, today, we have Michael Deere, he's a geographer uh, and uh, professor emeritus at uh, UC, University of California, uh, Berkeley, and honorary professor at, at uh, Bartlett, key proponent of the LA School of uh, Urbanism, uh, with many other colleagues that, that, that you have uh, read, and he will talk about the US-Mexico uh, border, uh, extremely interesting uh, subject matter, uh, and he promised us to make a short, short presentation. You have only 10 sli slides, I think, so he's going to be very, very precise, uh, and this will give us more time uh, to, 
uh, to talk. Uh, the reason we invited him is we, we met at a picnic in San Francisco at, at the beach, and you mentioned that you were just finishing, or you had just finished this, this book. So the first thing I did is I got the book and I read it, and I was so intrigued that we remained uh, in, in contact, and this was pre-Trump. Okay? So, <laughs> so no, little did we know what, what would emerge uh, from it. So this is a fantastic book. It's, uh, it's easy to read, and it reads like a criminal a story taking you on uh, this issue of how, with a very simple wall, to make, uh, to basically construct a, a territory that goes far beyond the line between Mexico and the United States. This is the text that you received. So it's a it's short, precise text to the point. And I want to show you one more image, is because after we got in touch and had discussions. Uh, Michael was invited to give a lecture organized by uh, the Lafarge Holzheim uh, Foundation in, in Detroit. Uh, and at that very time, a few weeks later, the CEO of the company was asked by a journalist, are you going to sell concrete? So he's, he's one of his, the biggest concrete uh, uh, manufacturer uh, in the world, okay, because they mer Holzim and Lafarge uh, merged, uh, and the, he had the microphone in front of him, and he said, "Yeah, obviously, I will send, I will sell concrete to the infrastructure projects of Donald uh, Trump because we are apolitical, okay, as a company." Uh, second question was, "What about the wall? Will you, you know, sell concrete for the wall?" And he stumbled; he was unprepared, uh, and he said, "Yes." This led to uh, outrage uh, on the side of the foundation, okay, and I'm a member of the foundation, and we said we will resign. And we launched this, uh, this web page, uh, and every member, so Ravena from Chile, uh, you know, colleagues from India, from Mexico, uh, signed this, this uh, letter saying that we will resign. Well, what happened is that the CEO resigned. Okay? There were other problems, so this was one, one of them. And what's exciting is that suddenly this, this issue of the wall became extremely poli uh, political uh, for those that are involved in, you know, in our business, in our industry. And as a respondent, we invited uh, Benedict Korf, who is sitting just next to uh, Michael. Uh, Benedict is currently the director of the uh, Institute of Geography at the University of uh, Zurich. Uh, and I stumbled on one of his books that I haven't read, because written, what, 2013, you said? Uh, Etiquette together with Timothy uh, Raymakers, uh, Violence on the Margins. So he is a geographer interested in questions of, of, of conflict within, within territories. And uh, this book, uh, as a subtitle, talks about states, conflicts, and borderlands. And this is why we invited you today, because we think that this zone between Mexico and the United States could be understood as a borderland. So thank you very much, two of you, for coming. And I'll give you the microphone. Please welcome Michael Deere first. Hello. Ooh. I am so pleased to be here. Um, you have no idea um, how pleased I am to be here. And I want to thank Mark for making it possible. Um, Mark spent a moment talking about how we met. <clears throat> and he's been a great champion of a, a lot of the ideas that concern me ever since then. And uh, here I am today. Um, I'd like to also thank Sasha and also Alejandra. Um, who have been very good in looking after me and making sure that the arrangements all worked. And um, uh, it's very smooth the way things work in Switzerland. And, you know, the trains come on time and stuff like that. It's quite amazing. Um, so I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'd like to get this off. And you can, you can look at that for a moment and dwell on what the border is and the 
the coloration around the border is quite deliberate. I'll explain that in a moment. But instead of talking about that right away, I, I want you to imagine something. I want you to ima imagine not being in Zurich now, um, but to be in Berkeley, in California. Um, and I, I'm, I'm being helped to, in my imagining by Jean-Pierre Pratzin, who's visiting from Bern, uh, who was a colleague of mine at Berkeley. Um, if you were students in Berkeley now, if you were a professor in Berkeley now, you'd be standing in front of me, or I'd be standing in front of you with a piece of paper in front of you. That piece of paper gives you instructions what to do when ice comes into the classroom. Wait. When ice comes into the classroom. I don't mean cold, right? I mean I-C-E, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. We call it ICE. Now, what this piece of paper does for me and for you is it gives, um, and this is really true, it gives me instructions what to do in my classroom if ICE invades the classroom. So you're here now, and, and if you were in California, a certain proportion of you would be undocumented, or at least, you know, dodgy kind of status. And in California, the ICE people raid, are able to raid university property in public universities and take people away. And that's, this, uh, this becomes very serious, and all faculty have been instructed as what to do when the federal law enforcement comes into your classroom. Understand this is California. It's kind of weird, but it's also kind of special. Because it's, it's not only a sanctuary city in San Francisco and Los Angeles, but it's a sanctuary state. The state government has declared itself a sanctuary and put it in direct conflict with the federal government. Federal government has told us that we are going to have money cut off, we are going to be prosecuted, etc., etc. The threat is very real. And you, of course, you can guess what California's response is. They've sued Donald Trump in response to that. So I'm, it, it, I think I, I need to tell you a little bit about that story so that you can position yourself in the debates that we confront. If you read about the newspapers, if you read about the United States in newspapers, you think that we're going completely nuts. I agree with you. The whole country's gone bananas. Um, or as we say in California, bananas. I can't say bananas uh, any other way. So please use that um, memory that we are going to see if we were doing this lecture in California, we would, here they come, here come the ICE agents. They're coming in on cue. Now I, have, I take my sheet out and I have instructions about how to deal with you because we protect you. UC Berkeley has fellowships to help undocumented students. There are signs in my neighborhood saying not only black lives matter, but everybody counts in my neighborhood and in my city. Berkeley is a sanctuary city, San Francisco is a sanctuary city, California is a sanctuary state. It's a huge statement about our values, because our governor has basically said we don't have the values that a certain president has on the other side of the country. Who the hell cares about them? They live far away. And that threat is real on a daily basis. Now, that said, Calm down, Michael. Let's, let's just put this in context. This is my border. I really like Mexico. I have to tell you that from, 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 from the beginning. You know. um, it doesn't, doesn't matter why. I don't have enough time to tell you why, but I do. The only time I didn't like it was when my girlfriend at the time quit me and went off with some Mexican guy. So furious about that, I thought I hated the country forever, but it, it, it didn't last. 
So uh, what I want to talk to you about is a time sometime after 9-11, um, when the Department of Homeland Security in the United States started building a wall between the US and Mexico. Um, it was mostly on the land boundary um, to Juarez and Paso, that's land, and then beyond Paso and Juarez, it's the river boundary, okay, the Rio Grande or the Rio Bravo del Norte uh, in Mexico. Um, this wasn't the first fencing that had been built. In 1945, about a, a mile or so of fence was built in Calexico, Calexico Me and Mexicali on the left-hand side there, to prevent Mexicans from getting into the United States. Um, and then in 1990s, when the undocumented migration process became so intense, um, we started building new walls then uh, in the major cities like Juarez and uh, uh, the two Nogales, Tijuana, San Diego. Um, to prevent hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people who were crossing the border at that time. Um, and that was the beginning of, of, the, of, the, of the era of fortification. I was fortunate or unfortunate because I started to travel the, the, the entire length of the border in the early 2000s. And um, I went along the border all the way on both sides. Um, I started off intending, you know, like a road trip, um, and, you know, I was going to drive the whole thing, but the first night I was, I was in the custody of the Border Patrol people. It just wasn't a good idea. And my, I was driving with a Mexican friend, and our two spouses give us health. It's not part of the deal when you go driving across America to spend the first night with the Border Patrol. Um, so I did it over two years, or maybe three years, and during that time, the first wall was built, or began to be built. And so inadvertently, I discovered what, it, what was happening in these communities. I also want you to understand that when I went there, I was expecting to see the conventional stories of drugs, immigration, and national security, because that's what that boundary is about. But I, I was interested in those three items probably for about two weeks, because I was entirely overcome by how wonderful this place is, and how the, the communities on both sides were so bound together. And so, kind of, what I'm interested in then, and what I still am now, and what was the focus of the, of the book that Mark kindly referred to earlier, was the third nation between the United States and Mexico. That, that bonded community where people tell me they have more in common with each other than they do with citizens of the United States or with Mexico. If you live in that border zone, you have more in common with people on the other side of the border than you do with people who govern you. That idea has stuck with me. Now, what does that mean? Benedict's going to work all this out for us. I, I don't have to explain it. He's, I pass that on to him. But I will say this. It's, it is a contested term. Right? Not everybody likes it. Uh, on, in the, on the Mexican side especially, when I talk about the Third Nation, they give me a real hard time because they see it as another effort by the United States, or United States academics, intellectuals, or whatever, of colonizing Mexico. Now, I don't happen to agree with that, but then I'm not on the other side. And I'll say this to you now, when I'm thinking about a nation, I'm thinking about a group of people with a common identity. You voluntarily associate with Switzerland, or whatever it is that you, know, you feel Sentiment, sentimental about. Um, I'm not suggesting for one moment that this is, a, this is a political entity called a nation state. It does not have a formal governance. But wait, it does. Because right in the oh, gone, map, map's gone. Right in the middle of Arizona and Sonora is an Indian nation, indigenous people's nation called the Tohono Odom. Nation. 
That nation is bisected by the international boundary. And believe me, the native people, the indigenous people who live there, couldn't give a fig about the international boundary. They have their own governance. They have their own arrangements. Those have been severely tested in recent years because the United States policy has been to shut that border down and consequently affect their lives. So what I'm going to say, I'm saying this to Benedict now and provoke him deeply and say that I can actually defend, <laughs> I can actually defend the notion of a third nation for all sorts of reasons. But I'm telling you too that this is a not, this is a controversial statement and you can decide for yourself. But that's what I'm interested in and that's what I became kind of obsessed with. Uh, understanding that we're, that we're talking about there, a way of seeing the border that has a, a material dimension, the amount of immigrants crossing the border every day, the connections between industries, the fact that a, a billion dollars worth of trade and commerce crosses this border every day. That's material. There's also a cognitive dimension. Those people who say, I have more in common with the other side than I do with my own nation. There's a mindset which insists on a way of seeing, like mind, my mindset is about seeing this as a third nation. I will defend it, but I also welcome criticism. But, so that's, that's that space, that's that territory that I'm going to be talking about, and that territory is constituted by an international boundary, but also by now the wall. When I'm saying the wall, I mean the whole panoply of apparatuses that go into referring to the division. They are aerial surveillance strategies. They are small, uh, like landing beach uh, interruptions. They're big walls. If you want to see pictures, you can look back at the, um, at the article which Mark referred to a moment ago, but I'll help you a little bit for those of you who don't know what the wall looks like. This is by, uh, photographed by a very well-known uh, US photographer called Richard Mizrak. Um, and I've chosen today to use a lot of illustrations um, from, uh, from artists um, whom I'm working with right now on a show, an exhibition, in the fall in, in California. Um, and you'll see why I, I like their work so much. I mean, the atmosphere of Mizrak is, and his photographs is quite amazing. That shows you what that fence is like. It's 25 feet high, and it looks impenetrable. Its architecture and design has changed quite radically since it began as a solid steel fence. Um, it's now got, it, it, in the front page of the, of the book that marks, it has perforations drilled into it, so people can see through to the other side. That one is actually a fence that you can see through, if you want to, and incidentally, it's also anti-climb, but it's so anti-climb, all you have to do, and migrants do this, is take two screwdrivers, and climb up and then climb down the other side. Alternatively, the same screwdrivers can be used to unscrew the panels and then people cross over and then they screw them back on. And, you know, this doesn't work. You know, <laughs> if, you're, if you're in any doubt, that, I mean, in my, the title of my book is not ambiguous, right? Even in Dutch or Swiss. Why walls won't work? I've, I've made my play there, okay? I don't have to tell you what I think. So, that's another version of the wall. This is another picture by Mizrak, okay? In Texas especially, Texas is really big. Texas is like 900 miles long. Um, the only way to visit Texas is to turn your radio onto the Tex-Mex music station and then sing along when you're it's big. 
They also don't like people building on their lands. 95% of Texas is privately owned. So when the federal government says, we're going to build a wall, they say, not on my land. And they mean it. I, in West Texas, which is where I got that from, can you see that? I'll tell you how it happened later. But the guy who was living there said, I'm always, um, you're from California, yes, yes. Well, you know, um, well, we're different here. We have, we have guns in the house. My wife has guns, I have guns. You know, my dog has a gun as well. And I'm saying, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, because I have trouble with guns. Um, and then he said, that the, two nights ago, or before, before I arrived there, the Border Patrol had raided his property. You know, and in, in this, is, this is out in the middle of nowhere in West Texas, right? And the, the, so these people stop, and he gets up, the dog goes nuts. The dog is looking for his gun, um, but, the, but the dog goes nuts. And the, the man grabs his armament and goes out, and he sees, fortunately, the two guys get out of this vehicle in the middle of the dark. It's really dark there. And he sees when they open the door that they're wearing Border Patrol badges on their shoulders. So he knows they're Border Patrol. So he screams over them and says, I've got guns. And the Border Patrol officers, being law-abiding police officers, say, we got guns too. So you can imagine, this is the middle of the night. And they, well, funny, they, they settle down and nobody dies. And he said, I spent the rest of the evening explaining to these Border Patrol guys that you don't come on to property in Texas. Don't come on to property without expecting to get met with violent force in response. So why, why is this like that? That's a fence. Now, you don't have to be really clever, and I know you all are really clever, to figure it out, if you wanted to cross to the other side, you'd kind of go like this, right? And you'd walk around and you'd be in the United States and that would be the end of it. That's not an effective protection against anybody. But we did it. We built that wall. And I also want to point out that, before time gets too long, that we don't, we, we have no idea whether it was effective or not. Kelly, who's now the chief of the White House staff with Trump, was head of Department of Homeland Security, and he said, walls don't work. Walls in and of themselves don't work. And moreover, federal governments don't measure the impact of the wall. There is no statistic in the United States saying um, the number of undocumented migrants into the United States has declined, remained the same, or increased. Nobody knows. Of course they don't know. They're undocumented. Don't be surprised. Right? So we don't know. So there's no direct measure of the effectiveness of this wall. The DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, said very early on, well, we didn't think these fences would stop people, but it would slow them down. Now, it probably takes five seconds to walk to the end of that war. It's not much of a slowdown. But the only thing that we've got is a series of indirect measures. And um, I'm going to show you an illustration now which is a very short summary of something that took me, it took me at least a year and a half to produce that slide. Um, number of border, what, what happened after 9-11? The number of border patrol agents doubled to 20,000. The number of undocumented migrants went down by 11%. We don't actually know that, you understand. That's a guess. What we do know and what we do measure is the number of apprehensions where you arrest somebody, right? We know what those statistics mean. 
and we, we can look at them and say the number of apprehensions went down by half by 2013. Now, well, at, at the peak time, there were 1.6 million apprehensions at the border. Now it's 300,000. That's a huge drop over a 10 year period. Okay? What you can't tell me, and what I can't prove to you, and what no one can prove, is the wall actually contributed to that loss, to that decline. In fact, I can quite categorically say to you that a wide variety of other factors cause the decline. The fact that the Mexican economy flourished. There was no need to go to the United States. The fact that the United States economy was in free fall in the late 2000s. Why would you go to a place when there was no jobs there? They had doubled the number of Border Patrol agents used more aerial surveillance, balloons, now they use drones uh, a lot. So all those factors contributed to the decline in apprehensions. Also contributing were, detention, were uh, detentions and deportations. Detentions tripled? Deportations tripled, I made a mistake. It's not a detention, it's a, it's a deportation. In Obama era and in George Bush era before then, the number of deportations went up to 450,000 a year. Now, you can't be t tossing people out at that rate and cutting down on the number of apprehensions and not expect the undocumented population to decline in the United States. So, the, oh, it doesn't matter about the deaths right now. Um, in fact, what happened as a result of all this, as a result of all this effort, is that the number of undocumented people in the United States fell from 12.4 million to 11.1 million over a 10 year period. We think, we don't know. But that's the estimate. And if that is the estimate, we, we got rid of a million and a quarter people, and we spent billions of dollars to achieve that end. I'm going to leave it to you to decide whether or not it's a good, good deal. But the net outcome of all this effort was the number of undocumented people num numerically went down by about a million. 10, 12%. And the wall, he said again, very categorically, the wall didn't help. The wall contributed virtually nothing to that decline. Therefore, why now does a certain person in Washington, D.C., who lives in the White House, want to build a second wall? It's going to cost us now $25 billion to finish the wall off. Question, why? Let me just warn you about something before. I want to warn you about something before we think a little bit more about that second wall. See, because if you look at what's happened, all that gain, if that's the word, of a million less undocumented people in the country has been offset by what I call collateral damage, incidental side effects. If you're an economist, externalities. Now, one of the side effects has been the growth of the detention industry in the United States. Every one of those circles represents a private detention center in the United States. It's a remarkable gulag effect along the edges of the nation, on, on the east and the west coast, and then along the borderline, you can guess where the border is, by the number of circles there. So if you start looking at the effect of the wall, 
and the immigration policy in my country, you can't simply look at those numbers and say, well, when a million people have gone, oh, yeah. Um, you've got to actually start looking at what's happened in the communities that are affected by this policy. And that's why this third nation blur of bubbles along the bottom is so important. Because the third nation has been dumped on, smashed by the security apparatus which has been put in place, including the wall. I'm, I can't tell you how angry people are uh, at, along the border by this whole apparatus. The other thing that's happened is the ICE that you know about and the Border Patrol, which you don't know about, have been subject or have been the, the source of a wide range of abuses over the last 10 years. You know why? Here's the secret. The U.S. Border Patrol has jurisdiction in the United States a hundred miles in from any border or ocean. Your homework, since you've got plenty of time this week and nothing else to do, your homework is to take that map and draw a line a hundred miles from the Canadian border in the north, from the two coasts, and then from the southern border. You will then have drawn a line which contains within it three quarters of the population of the United States. That means that me, others in the United States, are all subject to the authority of the Border Patrol. Now, <laughs> if you think that's amusing, you know, the ICE and Border Patrol people have the ability to set up checkpoints throughout the country, and they have. Border Patrol people can get on trains and demand your identification, and so on. And moreover, when they raid, they pick you up. It doesn't matter if you're tall, short, blue, black, man, woman, whatever it is. If they don't like you, they'll pick you up. This is really worrying, to put it bluntly and to put it mildly. So this kind of thing should cause you nightmares if you lived in my country. Of course, Switzerland is perfect. You don't have to worry about this. Um, but I worry about it a lot. So. Let me come back to the wall. There's a little diagram from the New York Times. And you can see quite categorically now where the, the I don't, I'm, I'm not very good with colors, so I don't know what color that is. Maybe it's red. Is it red? The line shows you where the wall has been built. And you can see from El Paso eastward that there's only very little wall down near Brownsville and Matamoros uh, on, on, the, on the eastern edge there. So when Trump says we're going to build a big, beautiful wall, um, we're going to build it mostly in the river area because most of the land area is already covered by a wall. So when he came into power, he said, we're going to build a wall. I spent the next four months, and I didn't stop. This is last year, the first part of last year, for four months, every day, saying, there already is a wall. There already is a wall. There already is a wall on CNN television, on blogging, in the New York Times. Whoever would listen to me, I'd say, there already is a wall. And I was rewarded by heaven. In April, when the New York Times had an article which opened up saying there already is a wall, um, it, I was exhausted by the end of it actually. Um, but it was a it was a major victory. Now the next question is, why are you going to build this wall? Twenty five million dollars, and we know it won't work. We're only building it for purely political reasons, to satisfy a political constituency that does not exist on the border. 
border dwellers, the third nation dwellers, do not want another wall. Still, you're architects, right? This is for you. These are walls. This is a prototype of the big, beautiful wall um, that our president is proposing. Now, uh, let me give, the, give it away, okay? We already have all the prototypes that we need. There's about 20 different types of fencing already existing, and I can show you that it, none of those work. So this is just pure politics. This is just absolutely... There's, there's no other word to describe it ludicrous. The conversation which followed this was equally ludicrous. There were people who moved in and said, oh, but these are works of art. What? You truly are out of your mind if you start moving into that kind of categorization. Nevertheless, I draw this to your attention because it's your responsibility to design the Third Nation. I work my socks off against this business because of the Third Nation. You too have a responsibility, not only personally, but also professionally. What are you going to do with this? When Mark talked about Lafarge Holcim, ultimately coming down and said, we would not supply cement for you to build this wall, that's a huge victory. It might not sound like much to you, but believe me, it is. And Semex, one of the other major uh, cement companies in the world in Mexico, said, you know, you take your wall and you know where you can stuff it. We are not providing you a cement for the wall. There are other ways of doing this. Not that I'm complaining, you understand. If Europe says, go away, and Mexico says, go away, I'll thank you. And I do thank you for that stance. But look at this. These are some of the people that I admire. And this is not me in drag. This is, this is a, um, a close friend artist in the Bay Area, Ana Teresa Fernandez. And one of her projects has been to go along the border and paint the fence out. And she's a striking person uh, in, by, by any stretch of the imagination. She's also incredibly talented. And she's in our fall show uh, in, in Richmond. Um, uh, but I can't go into that right now. The, it looks kind of funny and odd, but look what happens when that's painted out. This is, the, this is the fence at Playa de Tijuana, the western edge of the border. And the fence goes into the ocean. <laughs> okay. you, know, you know, you can swim. I, I admit that swimming around there is difficult, but it's not too difficult. Uh, um, and so it, she actually disappeared the fence. I think it's miraculous, actually. Um, and she did the same in Nogales and other places as well. Um, that statement that comes from artists um, and the kinds of statement that come from local communities is a key idea because a lot of people want to see this wall on a certain political persuasion. The rest of us have to fight it. And this kind of fighting that goes on impresses the hell out of me. So here I am back to this thing. Um, What, what, what can we do? I've challenged you to think about this professionally and personally. What can we do about the war? I'm, now, I'm, I'm looking more specifically now, not at that two-circle diagram that we began with, but with a more accurate sort of um, uh, ideogram about what my, what my community is. And I'm explicitly making the point that I don't know where the Third Nation is. I know that there are twin cities represented by those circles, Tijuana, San Diego, Ciudad uh, Juarez, uh, and El Paso, and so on. And I know that the borderline is a line, Benedict, a line, right? And I've got my twin cities around there. Then I've got my county boundaries, which are pretty important. And then I've got my state lines. This is a generalization, not, not real representations, right? And somewhere between the state lines, there's that third nation notion. It doesn't bother me that I can't define it exactly. 
it's going to vary. But, but, but it does mean that you have to figure out, you as designers have to figure out <clears throat> what you're going to do. My very close friend and architect, Ron Rael, wanted one day to enter a competition for those prototypes, to enter and show how, what could be done. I said, are you totally out of your mind? I know him well enough to say that. He would be stigmatized for the rest of his life if he'd entered that competition. Moreover, <clears throat> moreover, <clears throat> I said, who's sponsoring the competition, Ron? He didn't know. They wouldn't tell him. Well, it was either Russia, right? Or it was the DHS, the Department of Homeland Security. However, if you don't know, you don't enter. You certainly don't do that. Now, the challenge remains for you to figure this out, and I'm going to begin to show you how to move forward. I am going to try to move a little bit faster. Let there be no doubt that the citizens in the Third Nation do not want walls. They want more crossings. So the emphasis in their way of thinking is on what we call ports of entry, which are an important design question in their own right, and I really don't have time to, to show you all the, 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 the considerations here. They also want the walls down in the vast majority. All, all Mexicans do. Um, and a, at least three quarters of the population who lives around the border want them, don't want them there. They'll come down. Walls always come down. All right? It's a matter of time. I suggest that we should take them down and restore the mess that's been made by the security apparatus on the borderland terrain. This is a very important piece of land, not only for humans, but for animals on other resources. And you're really, you, the federal government, are really screwing it up and, and, and causing large jeopardies around here. Um, urbanists have typically drawn maps and diagrams of the border cities looking at the left. I, I, I have no time to go back on the other stuff now. Um, the, the thing that drives me crazy here is that if you want to understand the border, you don't draw a map, a diagram, a concept which has only half the city in it. There, are, there is an uh, equivalent city on the other side of the border. And so I've always liked it when we have aggregated, joint, binational versions of the city. It's the binationality and synergies between the two sides which are important. The border, yes, it separates, but it also connects. Even if your English isn't perfect, understand the distinction between separating and connecting. So, I want to draw something different. I can only begin to sketch this. This is my pride and joy. These are the, what is, dozen or so, major urban centers along the border, the Twin Cities. Okay. Now, I'm putting this on because the, the, these cities are integrated and connected, and the primary example is El Paso and Juarez. El Paso and Juarez were two kind of unified single centers before the U.S.-Mexico border was founded. They are a truly integrated city. You can't see where the boundary is between them if you stand up a little bit on the hills. And there, if you look at the, the data, um, you'll see that these, these, these two economies are linked. They're not identical, but they are integrated. It works as one, no doubt in my mind. 
This is not true of all the other cities. Okay, so and I've tried to show in the lower row there a dual city, for example, San Diego and Tijuana. They're not linked, really. They're far. San Diego is far enough away from the uh, from the border to actually ignore the border. A lot of San Diegans when they want to. Um, others are uh, like Paso and Juarez are integrated. A lot of them are unequal, in the sense that. The majority of cities on the Mexican side are bigger than the cities on the northern side. And then in some instance, you've got what I call a pimpel theory of urbanism. What's pimpel in German? <laughs> pimpel, acne. acne. Acne, that's a German word, right? Um, the pimpel theory of urbanism reflected in the situation of Calexico and Mexicali. Mexicali is the state capital of Baja California. It's two million people. Calexico has about, I don't know, 20,000 or something like that. It's like a suburban shopping mall for the Mexican city. It's in this difference that I begin to examine the, what I, you know, the, the different ways of trying to explain the city. Now, I've not left myself enough time to go into this. But I'll just give you a hint about the, the fabric, the material by which cities are built, are being built in this region right now. And the emphasis on, in this map is on the regional connectedness between the different cities, and also the apparatus of security the infrastructure of security, which is now being imposed on the environment. Not the least of which is the wall itself. Not the least of which is all the other variations um, that go into providing security for us. The thing that's important is that the dynamic of urbanism has shifted in border cities. And the most, I can only have time, I think, to say one thing about this. Um, the dark circles on either side of the old town in the center are ports of entry. The dynamics of urban change in border cities has shifted from the core to the hinterland, and the hinterland is composed of ports of entry. The ports of entry are now the organic dynamic of change in urban environments there. Now, I can go on and, and say more about this, but I'm, I'm running out of time. So I'll simply leave the idea with you that this revision of urban dynamics, this revision of the urban geography of a cross-border city is a point of departure for understanding what a public policy intervention should be. I'm going to give you, because you've been very good and attentive. This is Fernando Romero, a Mexican architect who's drawn this idea of a cross-border city linking Juarez and El Paso. I'm, I'm not particularly fond of it um, for reasons which I don't have time to go to to accept that if you remember Walter Kristalla and Central Place Theory in the 1930s in southern Germany, this is what this is, and it seems kind of dated 100 years later. But nevertheless, and Fernando is married into the Slim family, the richest family in Mexico. So all my friends disparage this. This is, this is not taken seriously. But it's an opening. If the richest guy in, in, the, in the country and opens a door to discuss their ways of building, I listen for a while anyway. Also, look at this. This is Shop Inc., a Mexican architect firm. And this is in uh, Avenida Revolución in Tijuana. It's a very busy tourist spot. And here's some new 
enterprise being put up, you know, the classical in-town new development. What's really interesting to me about this development is its name. And its name is Bajalta, California. Now, if you don't understand Spanish, Baja is lower and Alta is upper. Alta, California, Baja, California in the old days, right? And it wasn't, a f wasn't 10 years ago when I started talking about Bajalta, California, linking the two together again. Now, it sounds, it sounds nicer in Spanish than it does in English. So in, in English, it says it's like lower upper California. It doesn't have the same ring. Baja, Bajalta, California sounds much more. The thing is that that's now advertised, that's entered the, entered the realm of advertising, where the, where the joint identity between both sides in, in the development is entered that level of cognition, that level of understanding. I mean, forgive me if it's only a, a, a couple of ideas about the, the way we, sh we should be thinking about this. Um, I'm going to stop, but I want to say a couple of last things. Um, Mark, I'm going to have to save my hippopotamus. If, um, but I do have a great answer for you. Um, if we listen to the residents of a third nation, what they want is the following. To repair the damage that's been done by the wall, which means also taking it down. They want investments in infrastructure, by which I mean specifically they want more ports of entry, they want more crossings, they don't want more walls. And thirdly, they want their autonomy returned to them. They want the, the, the right to self-determination. Why? Well, partly because they have surveillance cameras in their communities, watching them, not watching the wall, pointed north into the United States. They have checkpoints, which drive everybody crazy, and they're quite right. They, they, you get stopped by the Border Patrol people anywhere within that 100-mile 100, 100 limit from a border. You get slowed down, and then you pass a sign which says, you know, we caught 50,000 cartel members, well, no, 50,000 pounds of cocaine last year. Okay, good, well, you know, can we now drive through because I've got to get to work? It's enormously irritating place and, and, and manner in which to live. I'll just, we'll stop and I'll simply say the following, that, oh, this is post-commodity. Um, this is called Repellent Fence, and I love this. Um, this line of balloons, which has kind of very much Indian, indigenous people signs on them, cross the border using these balloons, and they become kind of nationally famous because of this project. Their Latino uh, indigenous per personages origin, which makes their work even more interesting. I'm putting this up partly because I want you to think imaginatively about what the solution should look like. I also want you to point out that you know, I'm not a, an architect, I'm not a designer, right? You know that already. But, I, but I, and I've got a kind of a, what some people call an evidence-based approach to things. I need to have some information, some numbers before I can think. Uh, let me tell you the following, that so much of what we're doing is a waste of time in terms of policy, that you, you only have to look at that one chart that I put up earlier to say, we need to rethink things. Let me help you with one last series of observations. What we need to rethink. If the border apprehensions are down to a fifth of what they were, they're 20% of what they were 10 years ago, then we realize now that the, that the security issue in the United States is not a border issue. It's an issue of interior enforcement. 
it's okay. At that line is not where the action is. The action is inside the country now. Partly this is because hardly, relatively speaking, very few people are crossing the border. Most people are coming in and overstaying their visas. There are 400,000 people now who are overstayed on their visa, and we don't know where they are. So if you want to take a, if you, you know, if you want to risk trying to come into the United States, just overstay the visa. Don't come in through the Mexican border. The terrorists don't come in through the border. All the terrorist acts of, of extreme violence in the United States have been conducted by people who were born in the United States. Not because somebody from Lima one day decided to come up and do something stupid. We, we stopped that. Terrorism, coming, crossing by terrorism, is, is, by terrorists is, is not the thing. It's the overstairs that we, that, we, that we are worrying about. It's the interior enforcement that we're imposing on people who live in that country. It's not the cartels. You understand that your wall has done nothing, nothing to stop the import of drugs and human trafficking. Cartels, I don't like cartels. They're extremely violent. They, they worry me, right? But I'll be honest with you, all the time I've spent in Mexico, there's been no real, I mean, I'm careful that there's been no real concern. The only time I got really close to cartels was in a, in a neighborhood in Nogales where I was out taking pictures of the monuments. I love the monuments, right? So I'm taking pictures. And I couldn't get close to, the, to read the number on the monument. So my Mexican friend looked around, you know, and he said, oh, wait a second. And he saw a sign that said, Serenta Solteros meaning um, single rooms available, right? Now, single rooms are only available that close to the border by people who are going to make a jump over the border. So you knew you were in a neighborhood where there was active border crossing going on. And then my friend also recognized the cartel lookouts, young people who were in the community who were watching when you were coming through, and who was coming through. He, I said, oh, shit, you know, we've got to be careful here. No, 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 don't worry, said my friend, because he knew the mother of the young people who were watching us. So he walked up and chatted, I, you know, I know your mother, I know your aunt, and things like that. And so that was kind of cool. And the, he said, wait a minute, you know, he knew that the cartel lookouts would have binoculars at the back of the house. So he said, can we borrow your binoculars because my visiting friend from Berkeley needs to look at the monument and read the number, which is at a great distance. So they went to the house, they got out the binoculars which they used to spy on people who were coming to the neighborhood. They loaned the binoculars to me and I got to read the number, and we all shook hands and said goodbye. Now, at the same time, they're killing a lot of people. I'm just saying, I had more trouble with, the, with violence on the United States side than I did on the Mexican side in this, in this kind, kind of circumstance. So, I'm going to finish. I'll simply say this. This, this is... <clears throat> I, you can tell that I, I really get excited about this. My, this is an important thing to me. Um, <clears throat> and I think that we're going seriously wrong uh, in what we're doing right now. When, the last word I'll say is that in terms of the topics that you've been dealing with, um, there's a serious crisis of legitimacy in the United States now um, over what that new federal government is doing. California is at war with the federal government. California is at war with Trump. Um, there's no other, no other way to put it. 
um, it's the, the, the whole question of the legitimacy of the federal government, the whole question of the legitimacy of a capitalist enterprise is brought into question. There are lots of people who are fighting this tooth and nail. Anna Teresa, for example, is doing her thing. I'm doing whatever I can do. Every voice counts is the, is the byword of, of the action. There's the grassroots movement which really matter. That and the media. No matter what is said about the media, um, the power of the press and the significance of the work of uh, online journalism, the New York Times, the Washington Post, cannot be underestimated. There's also the, the power of the democratic process. I didn't think I'd ever say that, but, but that's what's happened or happening in the Mueller investigations into the Russian connection and Russian interference in, in our elections. The integrity and the power of those people who are much smarter than I am to, to penetrate this fog is actually very uplifting. I, di I didn't want then to leave you feeling, oh my God, you know, it's the end of the world. Um, sometimes it feels like that in the United States, but I'm on a daily basis heartened by the way in which ordinary people are taking on this neoliberal apparatus, the neoliberal state, authoritarian, repressive, and generally nasty, and the extreme plutocracy, the extremes of wealth in the United States, which are now worse than they've been for over a century. It's a real challenge. Um, it, I don't know what it looks like from your, your end, uh, but uh, um, this is part of it, and this is why I wanted to leave you with, an, with a sense that you know, if we, we can float a few balloons and we can have some fun, and in the meantime, we can smash the state. Thank you. I was, I was making that last statement, smash the state up. Well, Michael, thank you very much for this uh, uh, presentation, particularly also for the optimistic uh, ending. So we have Benedict Koff, who was writing like a madman next to me. Uh, so why don't I give you the mic straight away? Well, the question is whether the writing helped uh, to come up with a good uh, question. Um, maybe I would like to start with thinking about other places and other borders. Um, because I like um, your term of the borderlanders. And I think that is something that has been very prominent in many borderlands. That borderlands are not a place that are separated, but that are connected. Uh, that's actually a very common phenomenon in many um, borderlands that uh, we compiled, for example, in that book, in Africa or Asia. And um, that I think is in, in Europe and the US, we have somehow lost uh, a view of that, that that's a natural thing and that the border is really not something to separate but to connect. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we need to reimagine that much more. And also when we look at Europe, we have the border not anymore between maybe Switzerland and Germany, or Netherlands and Germany, but of course we have the border now at the edge of the EU, which becomes also fortified. But when we look at the, the EU border, we shouldn't forget what we have achieved inside of the EU, where I told you the story about this Exactly this, this uh, you call it, I think, not the, dual, not the dual one, but the integrated one, uh, where I remember a place uh, close to the Dutch-German border, where I, I studied in Aachen, which is close to the Dutch border, a technical university, also, I think, with a very famous architecture faculty. Um, and they had this wonderful place, I can't even remember the name, where if you cross the the street, you are in the other country. And at some point there was still a 
some small structure in the middle of the road indicating that you are crossing a country and the more you moved away from the Second World War, the, the lower that structure got and at the end it was completely erected and now you don't know anymore that there is a, a nation state border. And I think this is also some idea of a border that we should keep in mind when we have now this research of the idea a border is a wall and has to separate. So in that sense I really agree with, with uh, your assessment and, and also your political vision. Um, but. <laughs> Yes, and I think yeah, maybe maybe um, we we always tend we, we we tend to look at when we look at, we think at borderlands we we tend to look at a couple of paradigmatic cases. The one is U.S. Mexican border. Then we look at Israel Palestine, and we forget about all the other places where I think we can already see how things have always been or can be differently. And that's maybe my main um, first thought I have here. Continue. Let's continue along this this track because you know there is you're clearly advocating you know down with the wall. Uh, let's let's bring these territories uh, together. We should be very aware of the fact that uh, you know the global economy in general, you know the logistic systems that the apparatus of the logistic systems for NAFTA, for example, right? The kind of the transparency of borders from from Canada through the U.S. Uh, to Mexico had exactly the opposite, uh, and I had the same agenda uh, than you. Okay, so there, there are some uh, the vectors within neoliberal global uh, economy uh, that uh, you know, wants to overcome the nation states, uh, would have to have a, a fluidity of flows across uh, national, uh, national boundaries. So this is, this is extremely interesting. So what one could argue, Okay, I'm putting now Trump, Trump aside with his uh, own agenda, but you know what Clinton did, okay, with uh, reinforcing, you know, uh, more, more and more, uh, let's say, uh, more, and for, uh, um, uh, let's say, a higher degree of transparency uh, between between nation states is, as a matter of fact, a neoliberal agenda. Thank you so much. Really, really fascinating, but really also brings uh, those questions uh, about borders, other other borders. Um, we did uh, a study in my group uh, in Singapore, and uh, um, I can say I uh, I was quite uh, excited listening to your uh, thesis about uh, twin cities because we, we redrew Singapore as a regional metropolis, which includes uh, a Malaysian city called Johor and an Indonesian city called Batam, and that's a three-national border zone. Uh, the border is a maritime border, so a little bit uh, different. It, it separates, but it also connects, so it has all those different performances. It's also historical. It is uh, completely perceived differently from by the uh, let's say communities then it is portrayed in a kind of a, let's say a propagandist type of materials that are uh, uh, official and so forth so so many similarities um, but uh, uh, also many differences also many differences so for instance the uh, economic disparity is much more pronounced, perhaps, than in this region of Mexico and the United States. So possibly the fluxes would be much more extreme if that border was opened. The area itself is quite small, so the enforcement is extremely uh, hard. So the it is possible to control border crossings mm. to incredible degree. <laughs> The uh, technology and the nature of, of movement of people and goods has changed profoundly during the 20th century. So there is uh, also 
a sense that these borders have solidified increasingly and are becoming more and more solid as you know the technological tools allow this type of let's say surveillance and mm -hmm. apprehension detention <coughs> and so on um, and also also ethnicity and religion also play a role right so that uh, that is perhaps a difference to to the to the case of of the of the US and uh, and Mexico so so my my thoughts were rather about the kind of while you were talking about the specificities of the different mm -hmm. cases and how we might approach them as as projects let's say and something to to because i think it is it is somehow exciting how you frame it that border is at the same time a kind of metropolitan structure and that there is a project about it mm -hmm. you know in in perhaps every different case that we might be looking at and uh, something that mark said uh, uh, which which i think is true uh, and also case of singapore illustrates it really well how um, um, uh, let's say economic flows that uh, involve uh, basically the circulation of uh, goods and materials etc etc are uh, um, organized uh, through different types of structures that cannot be expressed anymore uh, by these schemes such as regional metropolis which essentially centers on the kind of project for the people right which is in fact the movement of labor and this is still regulated or it's in the hands of the nation states whereas the the movement of of um, i would say the the goods so the kind of logic of production is is uh, is very often now organized in a manner that um um well let's say follows separate rules and even even has a sort of separate territorial structures that enable it, uh, such as the you know special economic zones, uh, free trade zones, processing zones, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which um, which have a different logic, in fact, you know, which could could have a separate map. I don't know how it looks in this part of the world, but it's uh, it's often very distinctive. So in a way, those structures also generate urbanization and generate this logic of the flows of people. So I'm I'm curious in. Um, well, how, how do you see the, the case of U.S.-Mexico in relation to other cases? Mm -hmm. that, that's your <coughs> was Benedict's question. Right. Exactly. That's my question, too. Um, <laughs> the, the, well, some time ago, I mean, I began aut automatically thinking about what kind of comparative analysis could go on. And the three obvious ones were Israeli, Palestine, Berlin, and the last one I'd forgotten, but it was really important. Um, U.S. Mexico. Um, no, because we we can see there are examples about the way what's happened when the war collapses, what happens when you've got one conflict that's that's been going on a long time, and uh, the U.S. Mexico case, you know, a, a new one, a uh, relatively new one, happening now in terms of the, the degree of conflict there. Um, but then you start adding in other kind of African conflicts that, that Benedict knows about, and you start adding in also the movement across the Mediterranean Sea, because at one point I thought Spain, the Spanish situation would be most nearly approximate uh, for the one that, that's, got, that's with Mexico and the United States. But I also, I, mean, I, pull, ba I pull back from that because, look, frankly, it took me 10 or 15 years to be able to say something about the U.S.-Mexico border, um, and it takes so long to be able to say something seriously insightful, I think, unless you spend a lot of time uh, really digging into it. The, in the institutional nature of the of the problems is so different uh, that I that I backed away from it. Um, now, other people have done this. Reese Jones, for example, has done uh, a lot of comparative work and I admire the the confidence and um, uh, that they approach this work it's it comes down to the fact that if you're going to make comparative analyses across cases like this 
I think it has to be at a very high level of abstraction because when you get down into the details, the, the similarities and comparisons just don't hold up. Um, I, I think that the institutional uh, factors, which I haven't gone into today in this presentation, are so immensely different that the, that the level of generalizations sometimes can be useful, but sometimes, most of the times, are not. So I'm aware of it. I, I definitely say I don't practice it. I'm simply totally intimidated by the by the amount of work involved in getting to know the. the I'm when I, if, if I knew how much work was involved in studying the U.S.-Mexico border, it's two thousand miles long. I would never have started it. If I knew what was involved in writing that book, I would never have begun it. That my book was twice or three times the length, until the publisher said, "You know, you've got to cut this down," which is a good thing. Um, it's, but it's, it's such an in, intensely difficult thing to do. I can only admire people who have the courage to try it. Um, it's not, not a very good answer, but it's an honest one. The other question, um, and we didn't talk too much about this in the presentation, is it's about the whole neoliberal uh, climate which we find ourselves in now. And at the end of my presentation, I, I give a little flourish, like, like smash the state, which is a stupid thing to say, um, because I think that we do need the state. Um, and in fact, although it's going wrong, um, we, we cannot do without it. So let me backtrack for a second. Um, the argument that I'm making about politics in nations and in urban areas right now is operating at several different scales with several different groups. Um, you can say, on the one hand, the state, which is, you might want to call it the public sector, the civil society, which is the rest of us, and then what I identified as the grassroots. Um, we can do this and break it down in more detail, but, but using that, those broad schemes suggests that there's something seriously wrong with the state. Um, and, I, and I do think that's happening across the world right now, not only in the United States. Um, whether it's neoliberalism or more than that, but the, the that I prefer the notion that there's a crisis of legitimacy about the state in the old Habermas kind of terms, that people have lost faith in the state, and then the state isn't delivering the goods that it's meant to be, what, that it should be doing. That, this obviously varies between country, um, but generally speaking, that's that's created a crisis of democracy um, for th those of us approximately our age, where we where we've looked at uh, the expansion of democracy following the Second World War. I mean, it's actually been quite impressive in lots of ways. It's gone seriously wrong, or it might just be I'm getting older. Um, it's gone seriously wrong now, I think, in terms of its capacity to actually govern. Uh, and that means m making compromises between various interest groups. That's partly because of the fault of civil society. Civil society, in the United States at least, since the 1980s, has become increasingly unequal. There was something that Harrison and Bluestone called the Great U-Turn, where American society, U.S. society was getting more equal, and then about the 1980s it just veered off. And now it's reached a, a new level of inequality, which makes Mexico look pretty good sometimes, actually, in terms of the, uh, in terms of the concentration of wealth in our country. Um, it's actually tremendously worrying, and it's only going to get worse, um, I think, while, because the essence of the Trump approach is to extend deregulation is to free capital markets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that's created the crisis of 2008, when new regulations were imposed by the Obama administration. Now they've been taken off. Um, I think that <clears throat> that that's, that means to me a serious crisis of legitimacy that comes about by civil society and um, the uh, state, who have lost their basic social contract. The only thing that's keeping it together right now <clears throat> is a wonderful bunch of grassroots movement and also a more what you might call elite class, including the media, that's insisting that the, on, on, the, on the merits of American social contract, the forms of democracy that we have, and, and just praying, lit, almost literally praying, that, the, that it will be able to stand the 
the test. Now, I'll say one more thing, Mark, because it's important. Um, when I look at the relationship between US and Mexico, and here we might be looking at a specific that might be useful in terms of comparatives, the most important agency in border history in between the United States and Mexico has been the International Boundary and Water Commission, uh, Comisión de Internacional de Límite y Aguas in, in, in Mexico. It's the body of uh, administrative institutions that come together to look after the boundary, the, the monuments, they literally maintain the monuments, and they, and they are responsible for, for development projects and also sharing of water, which is big. Right? They've been doing this for since, well, since 1848, but in their current form, at least for a century right now. And they, they make minutes, and their minutes become law, and the waters of the Colorado River are shared by these agreements. One of the reasons that this works is because of they've got a very specific focus, and they have people on both sides who speak the same language, on the Spanish side and the English side. They speak engineering. And that common language enables them to come together and work together. It's a phenomenally successful intergovernmental binational authority. Um, now, I, I'm bringing that up because when I made this silly remark like smash the city, you can't do away with institutions like that. Um, it's really damaging and threatening to do away with NAFTA, but NAFTA was born of a neoliberal impulse, and it's done good things for both countries, it's also destroyed Mexican ag agriculture. So in that particular case, renegotiating NAFTA makes a lot of sense to me. Scrapping the deal sounds really stupid. Uh, so I, I, I don't think the way of out is very clear. I'll stop. I have two questions that um, I would be interested to hear how you see it emerging in Mexico. Mexico-US border, two observations that we took from the book on these different case studies. And one is that, um, I mean, one of the paradoxes is that the so-called borderlanders, um, they want the border to be porous, but they also need the border as an institution to flourish because many of their livelihoods also depend on the institution of the border, if they do, even if they somehow try to avoid the border by smuggling or something, that smuggling only makes sense where a border is and that you can get the extra profit from it, for example. Um, or even the whole migration business only works and provides income to these cartels because the border is there. Right. So there's somehow a paradox there. They don't want to ha have a wall, but they need some kind of border as an institution um, to make their livelihoods flourish at least some segments of the borderlanders. So that's one observation, and how, how you can see I, that. Can I answer it? I got a mic. Um, I'm not saying we don't need borders. I'm not saying we can do away with borders. We can patrol the borders, secure the borders by different ways other than the walls. Okay? That's, so that's an important thing to emphasize. Um, the second thing is, look, the cartels love walls. The cartels love the arrangements that we've got right now because they can control the flow of drugs and people through the, the fence quite easily. There's only a dozen points you can cross. So we manipulate the, we mani manipulate the crossings. Um, it's, it's very functional for illicit and, uh, substance and tra human trafficking. Um, but the point that I'm making is that until about the 1990s, there were large sections of the border which were not marked. You could, you could go and graze your cattle on the other side, you could go over on the weekends and play softball. Nobody said anything, right? Um, the, the cartels love the wars. Like everybody else, they're adapting to new circumstances. And so, yeah, there will always be exchange. It's in the nature of bounding. The, the, the exchange that we're looking at has been going on for two millennia, at least, in different forms. Um, and it's the adaptability of people to local conditions, which is what we are observing and, and you, you were referring to. I think that if you take the walls down and you secure the border, you'll see people actually flourishing and going back to 
older forms of connectivity. Um, second observation. Yes, second observation. Um, second observation is the, the borderland literature and African studies, they, they tend to also celebrate borders a bit. Um, and one, uh, one strange thing is that borders are often at the periphery of states, but at the same time they are very central to the working of sovereignty. And how the borders are policed or managed says something about like the sovereign, sovereignty in the center. How the border is managed in Congo is very different to the US, for example. And I think what you described is something where we see that the more like policed the border gets, it's not, it doesn't stick to the border, but it's trickling down to the center of the society more generally. Would you subscribe to that view? I don't know. <clears throat> um, it, I mean, if, if, when you start talking about that, I start thinking back to 19th century German political geographer Ratzel um, and pointing out the, the, the whole notion of a state as an organism. It'll grow and it'll expand. It needs Lebensraum and stuff like that. I'm not being critical. I think it's quite interesting. Um, but I think that trying to get a really clear handle uh, on some of the way these uh, interrelationships work and not really clear to me um, in terms of a general theory of anything uh, like that. Um, the, the edges are obviously important, um, but once the edge becomes secured in some way, it then, then like in the United States, it's a crisis of the internal area, right, where the policing and so on is, is extended now beyond and into the interior. So I'd fall back on my old, my old response, really. I mean, I'm, I'm familiar with the US-Mexico -Mex situation, and I can explain it in terms of the way you're, ex you're, you're talking. I would hesitate in trying to draw comparisons with other places. That was also not my intention. My question was more like, um, we often see like how the border is policed and managed, says something more fundamental, how the whole state and so state sovereignty is working. And I think what you described about this uh, moving of the whole security apparatus more and more into everyday lives to people even living far away from the border is some indication that we see something like that happening in the US. That was my moment. No. <laughs> no, it's just all. Um, I'm thinking about when I when I when I listen to what you're saying. I'm I think about um, about the United States, and I think okay, not so makes sense. Um, but then I think about the Canadian border. You know, so we've got an entirely different approach in the United States to the Canadian border than to the uh, Mexican border. Now there are a lot of good reasons for that, not the least of which because we don't like brown people. Um, there's, a, there's, there's a certain racist attitude there, um, and you know it's okay to deal with. Well, there's a lot less people in Canada, of course, and they're, they're a lot of them from British or French, and so they're more polite. Um, but I think that even within that one country, even in the United States, you know, you've got quite different attitudes to a, toward the northern border than you do to the southern border. What does that do to your theory? I'm not trying to answer his question. It's very, it's very sim similar to the EU, no? the border towards the outside. And in Canada, it's probably seen as part of the North American demise. Yeah. Yeah, maybe there is not such a big contradiction as I agree with Mark. Because, uh, like, it's the border to the outside. In the US, it's probably from the mentality. It's South America or Latin America, but Canada is somehow part of the North American. Elite. Yeah, but it's the same state. It's the same state, and I'm asking you. You know, you're going to have to go a, bit, a step further in your explanation to say, like, a good quality white people in the North are fine. They come from European stock, so we like them. But the brown people from the South, we don't like. It's the same state, though. Well, I think you just confirmed Benedict's Benedict's thesis. Did I? 
because it reflects <laughs> it reflects on it reflects on the interior. You know, the way you deal with the, the Canadian border, the way you deal with the Mexican border reflects on how you understand Canada or Mexico. So it has to do with the US. All ultimately. right, well, maybe we are, we are agreeing, damn. OK, so let's get some <laughs> questions from the audience. <laughs> Who's up? Who has got the question? I warn you, if there's no questions, I start lecturing again. Hello, um, thank you Hi. for the very pleasant uh, lecture and everything. I am from Berlin and I grew up there and I think it has for a long time been a border city. And uh, my dad used to say that Berlin is like a, um, I don't know if it's the right word, but rain warm, you can separate it and the two parts will continue to live but never grow one again. And I would be really interested in that if you could repair or if you could change a city that has been a border or a border place to another, um, yeah, if you could repair it or change it, yeah. I didn't hear it very well. Oh. No, no, can you just say it again? What did he say? Mm -hmm. Right. I don't agree with that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no. I mean, the, this, this, the, the example is extremely interesting, um, and uh, it's like a lot of other things that, you know. I, when I was a very young man, you know, I could never see a European Union. Um, and what's happened with the European Union is actually a staggering piece of history. Um, the unification of Berlin has actually gone on, and, and it's been reasonably successful. I thought it was going to be a lot worse than that, partly because the West has been able to invest so much in the East. Um, and, and that but not the other way around. Sorry? So this is, I think it was a one-sided affair. You know, the, the 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 East had to appropriate all uh, the the techniques and uh, lifestyles of the West. I, think I mean, it was it was a clearly a takeover in uh, in Germany. Um, did I you mean, we are not we are not talking about the DDR anymore. We are talking only about West Germany, who is now the entire country. I mean, I don't know what you think about it, but but you know the you know when. In 1989, the wall came down. We were all celebrating. You know, a few few years later, we realized the effects that that it had on the on East Germany. Yeah, but you know, this is this is what I'm. What, this is what I wanted to say to you. Um, it's it's. What, how does it go? Everybody starts out with the best of intentions, and then ultimately things end up a mess. And in between, there's nobody to blame. Okay, and the, 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 the point of suggestion here is that an, another way of talking about uh, neoliberalism is like a kind of a hacker capitalism, right? That, you, that we invented something really good and the, and the people who could make money out of it come in and they spoil things. Um, so it's, it, it's, it's perhaps like a little bit like that in, in, the, in, the, in the Berlin situation, where people started with good intentions and they were corrupted because of various reasons. Um, I just think there's a lot more of that happening. Yeah, so, uh, so the question that I have is um, um, really linked with, uh, with a kind of a... Um, a mediatized type of politics uh, surrounding border issues and migration. Because uh, what you're talking is uh, uh, about is uh, is really a kind of a common sense of of the reality, you know, of, of the borderland. And uh, you know, you say I traveled both sides. People are good. You know, uh, it's it's a, it's a it's a reasonable place. It's not about drugs and crime and so on. And uh, and we we tend to know that, and in fact we we have also seen in the European Union how um, 
let's say, the, the Syrian refugee crisis or the um, uh, various African crises and the, the, uh, the, the refugee wave was handled and mishandled in order to, to bring all, all type of uh, right-wing populists uh, into, into uh, let's say, the, the government right now in Europe. So uh, it's about uh, fear. I, I think it's about the fear of uh, kind of a, a rapid, uncontrollable uh, rush <laughs> onto the borders. And I think this is repeatedly, so nobody, in a way, I, I don't think people are afraid of uh, a kind of a peaceful, stable situation. I think people are afraid of the new type of dynamics, which is rapid, mm -hmm. and they want to protect themselves from it. No? And, and this, this type of sentiment is constantly abused recently. Right, in, we've seen in Germany, in, in Hungary, Orban built his wall, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so you you mentioned that uh, a, a couple of <laughs> questions ago, you said people should go to older forms of connectivity. I don't know what you meant, but I think the issue is essentially how to keep those border structures relatively stable, because we are looking into this future with uh, climate change and just you know, waiting for, for the big uh, waves across the Mediterranean. I mean, how to, how to handle that, right? So in a way, I think the kind of sta stability of borders, you know, if, if we have a chance to design, wonderful. But what, a, what about the kind of rapid, rapid uh, dynamism, let's say, of, of those situations? And I think this is essentially where Trump was successful. I think he was playing on those fears rather than, you know, we are in a, in a kind of a stable relationship with, with Mexico or so. Thank you for your lecture, uh, and uh, I really like your concept of the third nation. But uh, I want to know who is like the political body of the third, the, the of the third nation, and will it cause the like the independence of the region? Because in my country, there's something like that happened down the border, and Which country are you from? China. China. Um. I th it's a very good question, and I, and I think that if you look at different scales, uh, the national level, the, say the state level and the local level, you can see a large number of manifestations of what you could call cross-border organizations, which are public, private, and individual. Um, and the, the first example I gave was that International Boundary and Water Commission, which has been established for over 100 years and is quite fundamental to the interaction between the two countries. Um, at this, you know, the, the, the border governors of every uh, state along the border on both sides meet on an annual basis. Um, in every one of those twin cities, there are joint chambers of commerce, business organizations on both sides. Um, there are recreational and other kind of uh, independent organizations. A friend of mine just established a, a joint border tennis uh, association for youth, and the, the national tennis organization put money into it. And it's a cross-border tennis league. Um, I think what I'm, what I'm talking about is something that's extremely common on an everyday basis even down to the level of commuting to work on the other side. Those levels of connectivity are very well established. And what you see now is more and more independent actions by states and local authorities, municipalities, uh, to reinforce those ties. Okay. So Lisa's question? If you like. About the stability of uh, the wall, of maintaining the stability of the wall. 
Can you remind me what you said? Can you remind me what you said, please? You talked about the need to maintain the stability of the border, uh, considering the rush of, uh, of migrants that one might expect in the country. I, what, what I said is that it's uh, so the, the fear, fear of such, uh, let's say, rush <laughs> on, uh, let's say, European border or on the US border is misused in political, political discourse and it's it's been very successful in, in uh, yeah but, but I, I mean I don't think there's much I can do about that in the sense that the speed of change is is real and um, things are moving very fast in lots of ways and in an, in a lovely liberal, neoliberal world the levels of corruption and intervention are not necessarily increasing but they're becoming more apparent as they become more exposed um, so all those plutocratic authoritarian dimensions all those isn't the internet world the digital world moving fast yes it is very much faster than we than we can keep up keep up with it that's in a, in a sense to me, all background. Um, what I'm concerned about in this particular instance is border security, which is a, a real issue and I want to take care of. Now, all that having been said, the way in which individual interest groups will manipulate a discourse is something that, it, that is something kind of beyond me. It's, it's kind of crazy. Um, and there, it's part and parcel of that crisis of legitimacy that I see affecting government and, and, and civil society right now. But in a sense, it's, it's contextual for me rather than something that I think that I can actually do something about. Am I, am I missing something in your question? You, you, you said, uh, can, you, can you remember what uh, um, you said, uh, uh, people should go back to older forms of connectivity. Yes. What, what, did, what did you mean? Um, I, d I didn't literally mean go back to the old ways. Um, I was m making the point, I think, that uh, people adapt to circumstances and they've adapted to the wall. I mean, people, people's ability to put up with long commutes amazes me. But they've just they've just factored that crossing time into their daily life both both ways. I'm, I'm saying that people are resilient and able to adapt, and if uh, uh, no matter what the change in circumstances are, they will find ways of adaptation. There's a risk that we destroy them if they go on long enough, and we when we and we are harsh enough. All right. Before we close, uh, can you tell us something about this image? Is are, are the balloons representing the border, or are the balloons running perpendicular? Perpendicular. Perpendicular. Across. All right. It's in Mexico and the United States. So it's going across. Right. All right. Good. And well. They're, and, they're, and they're spiritual images. It's like the not exactly the. I think that's eye. important to know. Yes. Okay. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Benedict. Thank you very much, uh, Michael and and Melissa, and uh, join us next semester for a new theme. So yeah. bye bye. Oh, thank you.